Matt Fitzgerald, welcome to the show. Great to be here. Uh, so you're the author of the book, How Bad Do You Want It? Mastering the Psychology of Mind Over Muscle. And in it, you talk about the recent research that's been coming out about how high-performance endurance athletes and even weekend warrior athletes can push themselves beyond what their body tells them they're capable of doing. Um, but before we get into the recent research about that, let's can you put this in context? I mean, what was the history of how scientists or athletes or trainers, what did they believe um, was the way that human the human body managed fatigue or performance or how hard someone could push themselves? Um, and then how has it changed? And what's the research, recent research saying about that? Yeah, uh, great question. Uh, so, you know, athletes, especially champion athletes, have always known that you know, the, the mind was the, the primary limiter. I mean, nobody discounts the body, you know, you know, running a marathon or doing an Ironman triathlon is obviously an intensely physical experience, but, um, athletes have sort of always understood that, you know, it just comes down to being uh, a mental thing. First and foremost, uh, science has taken a while to catch up. Uh, the, you know, the, the discipline of, uh, exercise physiology is about a century old, and the sort of the original paradigm was a, you know, a strictly biological one. So, you know, athletes in competition were limited by, you know, just hard physical limits, things like, you know, lactic acid production or uh, muscle glycogen depletion, you know, the de depletion of your primary fuel source, th things like that, like as, as physical as a car running out of gas, you know, game over. Um, then a fellow, a South African uh, 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 researcher named Tim Noakes came along and proposed that. Um, really it's, uh, you know, that's the brain, uh, that limits performance, uh, before the body does. So, um, before the body ever reaches a point of kind of catastrophic failure where it just can't do anymore, there's a protective mechanism based in the brain that doesn't want you to basically exercise yourself to death, death. So when, when your brain receives feedback from your body, sort of, you know, red flag, uh, indicators that you're approaching your ultimate limit your brain will actually like unconsciously reduce output to your muscles and, and force you to slow down whether you want to or not. Um, fast forward another 10 years. So this is, this is sort of in the nineties when you know, Tim Noakes proposed what's called a, it's a, called a cent central governor model. Um, and then this fellow who actually wrote the forward to my book, uh, Samuela Marcora, Italian guy came along and, and his theory is really that, um, it's true that, uh, that we never are able to encounter our ultimate, ultimate physical limits um, in, in endurance activities. But what really limits us is not this kind of homunculus inside your brain, you know, pulling, pulling the strings like a puppeteer, um, but rather just pure psychology. So you just, what you do is, you know, you, if you get, if you hit the wall in a marathon, what's happening is you've reached your tolerance for just the suffering you're experiencing. It just, it's like, it's similar to pain tolerance, except it, it's, it's actually a different perception called perception of efforts. So you get to this point where it's just you're suffering too much and you voluntarily slow down. Um, and so, you know, there's you're not quite at your physical limits. You are approaching them, but you always reach that limit to just what you can consciously take uh, discomfort wise first. So so the current model is perception of it's I guess the perception of effort. Model? Yes. I mean, is, that, is that what you'd call it? So, I mean, can you talk about some of the, the research Marcola has done to sort of to bolster this argument that he has that it's more psychological and there's no, no, you know, central governor in our brain. It's just that we perceive something that's hard and we just give up because it's hard. What's some of the research that he's done to show that? Yeah. So there's, there's a, a variety of ways that uh, experimentally you can demonstrate that at the point of absolute exhaustion or failure or giving up, um, athletes always have reserve physical capacity. Um, one interesting study that, that Marcora did uh, kind, of, kind of proved this point was that he, he recruited a bunch of um, college rugby players who are, you know, a mentally tough crowd. And he had them, he had, had, the, had them do a two part experiment, well, a three part experiment, but he only told them about the first two parts. The first part, they got on stationary bikes and pedaled as hard as they could for five seconds. Then immediately after that, they had to pedal at a high but submaximal intensity as long as they could. So the instructions were: after this five-second sprint, you have to you know maintain this certain power output on your bike until you just can't anymore. Um, and then, as soon as they failed, that when they got to the point where they just broke down and stopped, 
he forced them to do another five second sprint. And what he found was that on average, the power output in that first five second sprint was about a thousand watts. Uh, and then in the second part where they were just at a high but sub-maximal intensity as long as they could go, their average power out output was, uh, I don't know, like 200, 300 watts, somewhere in there. And the point is, like, if they had truly gone to the point where they absolutely had nothing left to give and they were at their physical limit, then they couldn't possibly, in a second five-second sprint, immediately following that point of failure, they couldn't possibly generate any more wattage than they had put out during that you know, second part of the experiment. It would be like a car running with, with no gas, just physically impossible. And yet, in that, in that second five-second sprint, which you know, supposedly occurred at the point where they were absolutely exhausted, they put out about 750 watts. So it was less than they were able to put out when they had completely fresh legs, but still about three times more than they had put out in the second part of the experiment that ended, supposedly ended in absolute failure. So you know, the explanation for this is that these guys hadn't actually gone to the point of, of uh, absolute physical failure in the second part. They had simply just gotten to a level of suffering that they, they couldn't stand anymore. And when they were presented, you know, to their surprise with another five second sprint, it's just pure psychology. They said, oh, well, five seconds, that's no big deal. You know, <laughs> I can go ahead. I can I can handle anything for five seconds. So they, they went ahead and dug into that reserve capacity that they had hidden from themselves in that second part of the experiment. Interesting. And I guess you talk in the book too, just anecdotally of uh, people who run marathons or run some any type of race, they'll hit that wall, right? And they'll give up and they'll stop and start walking. Um, but then they still feel fresh, even though like it, it felt like they're about to die. Um, as soon as they stop, they still feel like they had some something in them. They could have kept going uh, longer or harder if they wanted to. Yeah, uh, this is um, yeah. You know, I, I make that point to try and distinguish perception of effort from fatigue. So everything, I think everyone kind of knows what a perception is. It's, it's sort of, you know, a specific modality through which your body interacts with the world. So thirst is a perception. Feeling hot or cold is a perception. Pain is a perception. But they're all distinct, right? You can't confuse thirst with pain. Um, and so the idea is that effort is also a distinct perception. It's a thing. And, you know, if you talk to the average endurance athlete, um, and, and you ask them, you know, when you hit the wall in a marathon, you know, what are you feeling? M most of them would say, well, it's fatigue. You know, I, I you know, I, I slowed down because I felt fatigue. Uh, but that's actually not the case. You are feeling fatigue, but the thing that makes you slow down is the effort perception. And, and the way to sort of make intuitive sense of that is to imagine, you know, say you are running you know, in the last miles of a marathon and you feel both very fatigued and a very high level of, uh, of perceived effort. As soon as you stop, you do feel a lot better. I mean, you know, I, I just ran my first ultra marathon, a 50 miler last weekend. And when I got to the finish line, I was completely wrecked, but stopping felt great. Well, why did stopping fe feel great? You know, obviously stopping at the end of an ultra marathon or a marathon doesn't have any effect on your fatigue level. You're still just as fatigued as you were when you, you were still running, but your effort level goes down, right? You know, you just stop. And so that's, that's really a way of showing that it's really the effort that is making you feel so, so miserable. The fatigue is there, but it's not the primary limiter in those circumstances. Right. You, your body, your, I guess, physiologically, you're able to keep going, uh, but mentally your body's saying, no, this is hard. So back off. Yes, exactly. Right. So, I mean, what are the factors that increase the perception of effort when you're running or doing other type of physical activity because like that's the thing it's like I, you know i don't do endurance events but i lift and like there's some days where it's just like everything just seems really light and easy and then the the next day like i'll do something the same weight and it just feels like hard i'm just like ah oh, i can't do this so what are some of the factors that th these researchers have found that affect our perception of effort well the, the biggest one is actually physical fatigue itself um because it, the, the analogy I like to use is, is a jockey on a horse. Uh, so the jockey is your brain and the horse is your body. So, you know, the, the horse won't move unless the jockey cracks the whip. And that's your brain telling your body to move. Um, now, if you have a strong, fresh horse, the jockey doesn't have to crack the whip very hard to make that horse move. But if you have a weak horse or a, a horse that's getting tired because it's, you know, it's been running for a long time, the jockey, your brain, has to work harder and harder 
to make that horse keep moving at, at the same speed. So it really is the jockey, to torture this metaphor, uh, it's the jockey, your brain, that wears out. Uh, but it's not as if physical fatigue doesn't matter because your brain, your brain is just the one that's willing your body to move. And as your body gets physically fatigued, your body becomes more and more resistant to your brain's will to move. And, and that's why, you know, mile 20 of a marathon feels so much worse than mile one, even though you're, you're still running at the same pace. Your brain has to work harder and harder and harder uh, to keep a tired body moving. Um, and it feels that resistance. And that is what causes perceived effort to, to climb. Right. But then on the inverse, you know, you talk about how, um, you know, there's a difference between physio, you know, body fatigue and brain fatigue. Right. And sometimes the jockeys tire, like the body, you know, the, the horse might be ra raring to go, but the the jockey, the brain is fatigued. So how does like brain fatigue influence perception of effort? I mean, how, or how, do, how does your brain become fatigued and how does it do that in a way where it affects your performance? Right. Yeah. So uh, to be clear, um, because there are, there are two schools of thought on this. You know, so, the, you know, the question is, okay, where does perception of effort come from? Um, one possibility is that it comes from feedback signals from your body. So, you know, obviously you, you, your brain is always sort of listening to your body. Um, and, you know, that's why you, you know where to put your foot down when, when you're running. Um, you know, you've got proprioception and all these other perceptions, uh, information that your brain is receiving from your body. So maybe perception of effort comes from your brain just feeling what your body's going through. The other possibility is that uh, perception of effort comes from brain activity itself. It comes from your, your brain's efforts to make your body move. And what the research is showing is that it's actually the latter. So, you know, it's, it's the jockey, not the horse. Um, so, uh, so either, so fatigue that originates either in the body or the brain could cause perception of effort to increase. I already gave the example of, you know, fatigue in the body causing perception of effort to increase because your brain has to work harder to make an unwilling body move. But it can also, there is also, as you just suggested, uh, a brain fatigue scenario um, so, uh, one of the, the studies that, that Samuel Marcora did to, to demonstrate this was that he had, he had a bunch of, uh, volunteers go through a, a mental exercise that was designed to tire out their brains before they exercised. So they were just sitting at desks, um, engaging in, you know, sort of a challenging mental task that it, obviously it did not tax their bodies in any way. It just made their brains tired and specifically certain parts of the brain that are known to be involved with perception of effort. And then, uh, so after this sort of brain fatiguing exercise, when the volunteers did uh, a, a challenging uh, endurance exercise test, they performed much more poorly than they did when they did the same test without prior brain fatiguing. So, you know, th there, there's an example that you sort of need a fresh brain and a, and a fresh body if you want to be able to, to, to perform your best physically. Right. And so is this why caffeine helps, you know, or partly helps you have a better workout or a better training session or a better run? Yes. Because it stimulates the brain? Yeah. So for a long time, you know, when that original sort of, you know, strictly biological model of endurance performance was dominant, uh, people looked for all kinds of, you know, reasons why caffeine was known to enhance performance, but the question was why. And, they, you know, it was proposed that it allowed the body to utilize fat more effectively or whatever. But none of that is true. Uh, all caffeine really does is, well, I mean, yeah, I should say caffeine does has, have physiological effects, but the reason it enhances endurance performance is the same reason it makes you alert and you know, lifts your mood when you have a cup of coffee in the morning you know, before starting work. Um, it, the, the caffeine acts on certain parts of the brain that are involved in, in generating perception of effort so that when you go out and, and run a 10 minute mile, it feels easier than it does uh, if you haven't had caffeine first. And, and so it allows you, it's just one of those things by, by altering the, the, the relationship between actual effort and perceived effort, it allows you to dig a little bit more into that hidden reserve uh, um, than when you're not chemically enhanced. Right. And it, it's interesting too, to see some of the stuff that's coming out now, now that uh, trainers and athletes understand this uh, jockey horse analogy and that the jockey has a lot more control. Uh, I've been seeing, I saw this like headset that you put on your head and like it sends like electricity through your brain to stimulate the brain before a workout to help you have a better workout. Yeah. I think it was, it's called yeah. transdermal something. I don't know what it's called. 
Yeah, transcranial electromagnetic stimulation. Uh, right. Yeah, it, it sounds. I, I'm not sure about that specific product, but uh, you know that that has been studied, and it, it is it is in fact performance enhancing if you do it right. You're right, zap, so yeah. zapping your brain in the right spots. Yeah. So yeah, I forgot the name of the device, but like you put it on your head. It's like a pair of headphones, and it just zaps your brain for like 30 minutes, and it's supposed to help you perform. I guess the U.S. Um, lo- uh, the ski jump team they've been using it or studying it, and it's helping out. They're showing that it, it is helping. Just weird. We're doing some weird 21st, you know, 23rd century brave new world yeah. stuff now. Science fiction. Right. So, I mean, okay, so here's a question I have. Um, you know, with the, the central governor model, you know, to me that when I first re- heard about it, it makes intuitive sense from, say, an evolutionary point that, yeah, it would make sense that our brain has this central governor that says, you know, hold off, you know, pull back. You're, you're about to push yourself too hard. If you push yourself even more, you might kill yourself. I'm curious, have these researchers who have been studying the perception of effort model, have they figured out why, I mean, is there an adaptive advantage to it? Is it, is it very similar to, you know, the role a central governor would have in protecting our body from killing ourselves? Or is there really no reason why we have this perception of effort thing? Yeah. I mean, you you can, you can only really speculate. um, Sure. You know, (laughs) Biologists will dismiss them as just so stories, you know, because you right, always right. say, well, this makes sense, but that doesn't mean it's true. But, um, you know, with full awareness of, of that potential pitfall, Sam Wella Marquora has pro- proposed that there is an adaptive advantage. And, and that is that, um, well, let's back up. The, the question is, why is exercise hard? Why does it feel uh, uncomfortable to exercise? And so, you know, the, the, the answer to that, that, that Marquora proposes is that, uh, it prevents you from wasting energy. You know, energy is a precious resource, resource uh, never more so than in extremely primitive times um, when, you know, presumably, you know, the earliest humans were, you know, chasing prey and, and fleeing predators and all that. So if exercise had no cost in discomfort whatsoever, you could potentially have people uh, just uh, exerting themselves unnecessarily. Um, and then not having any energy left for when they really needed it. Um, so that, that's just it. And, it, you know, it's clearly why most people just don't exercise at all today. I mean, everyone knows that you should exercise, that it's good for you to exercise. And yet most people don't do it uh, because, you know, our circumstances have changed. We're not, you know, chasing predators or fleeing prey anymore. Um, you know, we're working at offices and, and sitting in commuter traffic. Um, so now that's become a barrier. The fact that, that exercise is physically un- uncomfortable uh, is preventing a lot of us from doing it at, at all, even though intellectually we know all the advantages. So um, in the book, you talk about there's a difference between uh, physical and mental fitness. And we've been talking about that with the, the jockey horse analogy. Uh, but that you say that sometimes uh, an individual with more mental fitness who has, you know, who has a stronger jockey can beat the person with more physical fitness. Now, granted, we're talking about high performance athletes here. I mean, if you, if you are a couch potato, have never run a 5k ever. And even if you have the strongest jockey in the world, you're probably not going to beat, you know, someone who's been running marathons their entire life. But uh, can you provide some real life examples of this, of someone who they were, you know, physiologically, they were not as high of an athlete as their competitor, but because they had a stronger mental fitness, they're able to beat uh, that you know, stronger, uh, physically fit athlete. Yeah. So the uh, the example I give um, in in the book uh, is about a, a Kenyan runner named Sammy Wanjiru. Uh, now, Sammy was as physically gifted as any runner who's ever lived, um, but he also had a wild side. So uh, he won the Olympic marathon when he was, uh, I think, twenty one years old, uh, maybe twenty three. Um, and then uh, after that, he sort of, you know, he kind of got soft a little bit. He just partied all the time and, um, you know, uh, drank a lot and, and slacked off his training. Um, and then uh, so the, the 2010 Chicago Marathon rolls around and um, the, the lead up to that had just been disastrous. His, uh, Sammy's coach didn't even want him to run. His manager wanted him to, you know, basically go to rehab. 
Um, so he, you know, his training, he had been injured. His training had been spotty. He was overweight. He couldn't keep up with his own training partners who he, he usually demolished. So he was, he was physically probably the best runner in the world, but he was, he, he rated, and he also got the flu like, uh, like three weeks before race day. So he, uh, before the race, he said, I'm, I'm at about 75%. And that wasn't sandbagging. That was the truth. Um, but he ended up winning the race. So it's one of the most, I know, I understand that for a lot of people watching a marathon is like watching grass grow, but, uh, it's, it's one of the most thrilling, uh, marathons I've ever, ever, ever watched. It was just, well, Hey man, I was going to read to your credit when I was reading, you know, the story, you know, how you described this, like, wow, this actually sounds really exciting. Like you did such a great job, you know, putting in the drama and like letting people understand what was going on. So kudos to you for doing that. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, it is, it, 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 it was quite dramatic, especially if you knew something of the backstory. So anyway, you know, long story short, you know, Sammy ended up squeaking out the tiniest victory, um, and it was just it was just plain obvious to to anyone, uh, any any sort of I guess knowledgeable <clears throat> runner watching that that Sammy was the weaker runner that day. And you know, if there had been exercise scientists on the scene, they could have proven that they could have you know taken biopsies and such to to show that that in fact. Sammy was closer to his ultimate physical limit than uh, the guy, the guy he, he beat. Um, so there, there, there's an example right there. And, 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 you know, athletes know this, you know, the champion, athlete, when, when you're just an average, you know, athlete like I am, and you look at the champions, you just assume that it's purely physical all the way to the top. You know, the, the reason, the, you know, the reason the, the second place finisher finishes ahead of me is the same reason the first place finisher finishes ahead of the second place finisher. And that, that's sometimes true. And often the most physically gifted athlete does win, but, but not always because uh, the mental side is just as important. We're talking about small differences at that level, but, but they can be either physical or, or mental that sort of, you know, are ultimately decisive. Right. I mean, it seems too that uh, in all domains of athletics, with the, especially in the high levels where the training, the nutrition is all on point, like everyone is pretty much doing the same thing. There's, there's some parity going on on the physiological level. And I guess the thing that's going to separate individuals now is the mental aspect. Yeah. And, and the cool thing is that that's the a- aspect that, um, is uh, decisive within the context of competition itself, right? Like, you know, on the starting line, the training is done and your genes are your genes. So that's all in place. Um, but, you know, the, the, the mental part plays out in real time, you know, in, in, in every race, anyone who's ever done, you know, any type, even if it's just a 5k or whatever, it gets hard. And it, it's almost, um, it's almost like a life or death kind of feeling. It gets, you know, it can get so hard. Um, but there's no there's no actual wall there. You're you're just basically deciding at every point of the way, <clears throat> am I going to push harder or am I going to you know pack it in? Um, and that's you know it's it's an acquired taste, but that's what keeps so many of us coming back for more. Is that it's a real uh, compelling test of, of your metal. Yeah, masochist. <laughs> what you guys are, especially those endurance those ultra marathon guys. Um, so. Let's talk about this. Um, so if we can train ourselves to push ourselves beyond what our perception of effort thinks we're capable of doing, well, I mean, okay, here's, here, before we back up, so there's some athletes who are able to do this, who are able to push themselves beyond what they think they're able to do or what their perceived effort is. I'm curious, is this an inborn skill or is this something that can be developed as well? Um, I, I would say it's definitely both just like, you know, just like the physical side, um, you know, you, you're not going to be an Olympic champion unless you win the genetic lottery. Uh, but no matter what kind of genes you're born with that, that alone ain't going to do it. You know, you have to work your tail off and make smart decisions and how you develop as an athlete. And it's the, the same thing is true on, on the physical side there, you know, because it's really, um, it's really your personality actually that, that decides whether you're mentally fit or not. And that's why it's not always the same formula for, for every athlete. Uh, like, you know, for some athletes, like take that Sammy Wanjiro example, he had a reckless personality, but it was his recklessness. He actually, he actually died at age 24, by the way, he fell off a balcony in a drunken stupor. Uh, so the same recklessness that Ed led to his early demise was a great advantage on the race course. But that doesn't mean that every great endurance athlete has a reckless streak. Um, 
for some people, um, like Louis Zamperini, the the guy that the Unbroken movie was made about. Yeah. Um, you know, for him, it wasn't recklessness; it was unbridled optimism. So the same characteristic that allowed him to survive, you know, as a prisoner of war in in Japan in World War II, was what made him a champion endurance athlete. So so you know, obviously, personality is largely something that you're born with. But the good news is, um, uh, you can also develop these these coping skills or, you know, or or these mental fitness traits. One of them is known as inhibitory control. And inhibitory control comes into play anytime uh, you want two things simultaneously that are contradictory. You can't have them both. The example I always like to give is you want to lose 10 pounds, but you want that piece of German chocolate cake sitting in front of you. You can't have both. So you're sort of divided and your brain has to decide which one you want to choose and stay focused on. And it's easy to understand how inhibitory control matters on a race course because you get to a point in a race where you, you want to finish and achieve your goal. But at the same time, you want to stop suffering. So you're getting pulled in two directions and you have to decide, all right, which which thing do I actually want most? And it, it takes a skill called inhibitory control to do that. There are tests of this in, of, of inhibitory control. You just sit down in front of a computer and you're sort of required to make these kinds of choices. And, and some people are better at it than others are, but it is trainable. You can get better at it. And in fact, um, one of the ways to get better at it is to get in shape. Because uh, when you when you train physically train, you're confronted with that desire to quit and end your suffering all the time. So if day after day you make the decision to get going, um, that alone will actually enhance your inhibitory control. So yeah, uh, it increases your willpower to make the right choice. So before we get into some of these other coping skills, um, is this and with all of them, do you have to train them within the context of the sport or exercise that you're doing? Or can you do things that train that coping skill outside of the, the event and then it'll carry over to uh, endurance, your, your race, for example? Does that question yes. make sense? Yes. So, you know, yeah, I mean, anything, anything that happens in your life uh, that affects your, your psychology could end up you know, affecting you as an athlete. So, um, for example, it could be, um, just like a struggle you go through in your personal life that sort of tests you, um, and, and strengthens you. And so it could have that struggle, personal struggle might have nothing to do with athletics, but you know, you only have one brain. So the brain, the same psychology that you apply in your personal life, you're going to apply in the race course too. So, you know, something you go through like that could end up uh, making you a better athlete, but you can also, uh, you know, proactively sort of choose ways to enhance your mental fitness, you know, off the race course or off the training grounds. Um, one of them, you know, again, to, to cite a study that Sam Wella Marcora did is uh, positive self-talk. Um, so the idea is that it's like, you know, the little engine that could, I think I can, I think I can, you know, anytime you start to struggle uh, with fatigue and, uh, you know, perception of effort, you're going to think negative thoughts. It, it's, it's impossible to stop them from coming. But it's been shown that if you sort of train yourself to arrest those thoughts early and replace them with positive alternatives, it's actually performance enhancing. And Marcora did a study that that proved that. It's actually a fascinating study because he took a bunch of non-athletes and he had them do you know the usual endurance test, you know, sort of before and after. Uh, after the before test, half of the subjects were trained in positive self-talk, uh, and the other half were not. And then when the test was repeated, the, those who got the positive self-talk training performed way better, like 20% better in, in the same test. And obviously, there was no improvement in the control group. What's amazing about that is that there was no physical exercise involved at all. I mean, it, it, was, it was a physical endurance test that they improved on simply through a purely psychological intervention, uh, which is cool. So, I mean, what does the self-talk look like? Do you just tell yourself, I think I can, or do you just like, you got this? And what is it that you're supposed to say to yourself? Yeah, I, I don't know the details of exactly what um, Mark Hora did, but but any experienced athlete, you know, as I am, sort of learns what it means uh, for, for you. But generally the way it works is uh, you, you get to, you know, a point where you're struggling and then you have a negative thought and then... You instead of just allowing that to happen, you step back from yourself and realize you're having a negative thought, and you you just consciously stop it and replace it with something else. Now, what I found is that that something else 
uh, is, is different for different athletes. You know, the, the thing that works for one might not work for the other. So you can sort of, you know, try to give people a one size fits all right. uh, thing to, to go into. And, and that could help somewhat. But ultimately, what I've found is that in those moment, moments of crisis, your brain gets really creative uh, because you're looking for lifelines, you know, sort of psychological lifelines. Um, and it, it's interesting to see what you come up with. And, and I tell athletes, uh, when you find something, you know, that works for you, remember it, because then you can sort of come up with your own formula and, and go in better armed uh, the next time around. So I think what I thought was interesting with all these coping skills you discussed in the book, and we'll talk about more in a bit, but uh, visualization was one that you said that really doesn't work or can even backfire. And that's been like an article of faith in sports psychology, right? That you're supposed to like, the athlete's supposed to take time. You know, if you're a quarterback, you're supposed to like sit, lay down and like imagine the game and imagine yourself going through a tough situation and then seeing how you would respond in very detailed, um, detailed descriptions. Why is it that visualization can sometimes backfire in helping you manage perceived effort? Right. So to be clear, when, when done right, visualization or, or mental rehearsal, as, it, as it's sometimes called, does work or, or can work, but <clears throat> it's often done wrong, um, and that's when it that's when it can backfire. Um, what what you don't want to do with visualization is um, uh, be unrealistic um, and, and and imagine sort of a pie in the sky perfect uh, race scenario. Because guess what? that race ain't going to be perfect. Um, and I talk about an example of an athlete in, in the book, um, you know, a world champion triathlete uh, named Siri Lindley, who made exactly that mistake. She was training for, uh, to qualify for the first uh, Olympic triathlon. Um, and she was considered, you know, she was, a, she was one of the best triathletes in the world. She was the best American. So she was considered a shoe in. And what she did is every night starting one year before the Olympic trials, she would visualize the perfect race and over and over again, it was, it was the same, you know, she got off to a great start and she was following the world champion in the swim and uh, you know, and so on and so on. Uh, and then when the trials came around right away, something went off script. Uh, she ended up kind of just getting sw uh, dunked underwater and swum over the top of during the swim, which was not part of her rehearsal. And she panicked. And she ended up not even finishing the race, not for any physical reason, but just because she lost her cool because her, her vi visualization had set her up for failure. Um, so, you know, that's that's what you want to avoid when you the, the proper way to use visualization is to make it as realistic as possible. You want it to be positive. You want to picture yourself performing well, but you want to you want to you want to imagine the struggle uh, that you're going to go through. You want you, you want to imagine it being hard. Uh, on the way toward a, a successful outcome. Right. So this this ties in with your uh, the one of the first coping skills you talk about in the book is the idea of bracing. You know, just accepting the fact that it's going to be hard, and that can do a lot to uh, help you push beyond your perceived effort. Exactly. So um, I should explain that um, perceived effort sort of has two layers. So at any given point when when you're doing a race. The, the first layer is just how you feel and you can't do anything about that. You know, if you get, you know, 20 miles into a marathon to go back to the same example, um, you know, how you feel is how you feel. You know, you, you've just gotten to that point and it is what it is. But there's also a second layer, which is how you feel about how you feel. So and that you can do something about you can sort of you know, with any given level of suffering or effort you're experiencing, you can sort of have a bad attitude about it or a good attitude about it. So it's a, it's a matter of how you interpret it. And uh, what research shows is that if you uh, sort of maintain a good attitude or, or a positive interpretation of, of how you're feeling, no matter how bad you actually feel, you, you will be able to squeeze a little bit uh, better performance out of yourself. And one of the things that affects how you feel about how you feel is prior expectations. So if you get, you know, halfway through a race and you're suffering more than you expected to, you're more likely to have a bad attitude about how you feel and perform worse. Uh, and that's where bracing comes in. Bracing sounds like pessimism. Basically, before the idea is before a race, you should be telling yourself, this is going to be hard. This could be the hardest thing I've ever done. But it's not really pessimism because you're not saying I won't perform well, I won't achieve my goal. You're just setting yourself up 
to be ready for any amount of struggle you might experience. So if you if you uh, equip yourself in that way before you go into the race, then sort of you'll never be surprised by by how bad you feel, and you'll always have as as positive an attitude as you possibly could about how you feel, and and, and you won't be hamstrung. Uh, uh, psychologically in your performance. Right. And this is why you talk about in the book, Prefontaine, the great distance runner, like before <laughs> runs, he, his teammates would always talk about how you just be kind of a grouch. He's like, I don't want to do this. I hate running in the cold. Um, but then he'd go on to perform, you know, wonderfully. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's exactly what, what he was doing there. It's just, he was sort of, uh, you know, he, he, he was just, he did it instinctively, you know, it was just something he did perhaps not even knowing why. Uh, but obviously it worked was, you know, he was known as one of the grittiest, um, you know, toughest, uh, runners of his, his generation. And that was part of his formula is just to, just to say, you know, this is going to suck. I don't, I don't even want to be here. Um, I think it might've served two purposes for him. One would be bracing. The other would just be to take a little bit of the pressure off of himself. Um, just sort of relax, you know, it's like sort of almost like letting himself off the hook a bit just so he could get to the point so he wouldn't freak out before the gun went off when the gun went off he was fine he just had to get to that point uh and he he used uh he just used his own recipe to get there right so it helps prevent choking which you talk about in detail in the book um yep and i I mean going back to siri lindley uh that's sort of the cope that's the coping skill that she used this letting go of you know she was gung-ho about you know winning the olympic triathlon um but then for some reason you got this coach that told her no you just got to let go of that goal and it ended up counterintuitively helping her reach that goal exactly um you know it's funny someone uh someone who just just read this book uh sent me a a, a tweet uh with a bruce springsteen quote in it that that this reader was reminded of by that that exact uh, episode there and basically what Bruce Springsteen said is, uh, he said, when I go on stage, I feel like I can't perform the way I want to unless I feel like it's the most important thing in the world. And yet, he, he said, I also can't perform the way I want to unless my attitude is, you know what, it's just rock and roll. So he said, yeah, so there's sort of a, a balance there where his, he's sort of uh, mentally in two very different places at once. Like, this is super important. I need to take this seriously. But at the same time, hey, you know what? It's not the end of the world if I, if I hit a, if a, you know, a string breaks or whatever. So that's, that's, it. that's exactly it. That's, that's the attitude you have to have as an athlete where you want your goal very badly. But at the same time, you, you sort of, you're loose. Uh, you know, if, and what, what can happen is sometimes, and it spe- especially happens to athletes like Siri who have confidence issues or insecurity issues, is that, they will, their goal will become something that they can't live without achieving. So the idea is, you know, if, I, if I don't achieve my goal in this race, I'll hate myself. I won't think I'm a good person. I'll think I'm a bad athlete. Uh, but, but champions, actually, they don't have that attitude. They, they're actually more likely to make excuses. Uh, so the, the, their attitude is, I already know I'm great, and I want to achieve this goal, but you know what? If I don't, it's because my shoes suck or because the weather was bad. Um, that's actually, it sounds like sort of immature, but it's actually a healthier attitude. It's more likely to help you perform where you, you, know, you, you have goals and you want them very badly, but you sort of have a loose grasp on them. Your goals aren't determining how you feel about yourself. Um, and that's, that's exactly what prevents you from choking. You're, you go into competition less self-conscious and you're allowed to just immerse yourself in what you're doing um, and just, you know, the, the, in, in ball sports, it's, it's always referred to as looseness. You know what I mean? It's like, you know, the team, which team is looser going into the Super Bowl or, or whatever the championship game is. And, and um, that's exactly the, the, the same phenomenon. It's not that they don't care, uh, but they just care in a way that's more likely to actually have a, have a positive outcome. So I'm, I'm curious about the research about um, working out or training or competing with the group that allows us to push ourselves beyond what we're thought we're capable of. Cause I think a lot of people think of particularly endurance sports running as individual, um, sports, right? It's just about the, the single, so low lone athlete, but you argue that there's an actual social component going on there that these individual athletes use or harness to push themselves beyond perceived effort. 
Yep. So, you know, human beings are social animals. So we, we behave differently in groups than we do alone. Uh, and that includes when we are testing uh, our endurance performance capacity. Um, so just to <clears throat> make this concrete, uh, there's uh, an example that I describe, a, a, a study that I describe in the book involving rowers, where uh, a, a group of rowers were asked to do um, an indoor rowing workout on two separate occasions. And there were eight of these guys that were Oxford universities, you know, sort of elite level rowers. And they did, they did the performance test on uh, indoor rowing machines alone, and then all together in a group of eight, it was exactly the same workout. Uh, they just did it, you know, alone and together. And then after both of those tests, they were subjected to a test of pain tolerance. And it was found that their pain tolerance was significantly higher after they'd done the workout as a group. Uh, and the authors of the study speculated that that was because when the, the rowers did the workout as a group, their brains released more endorphins, which are kind of the, the, the runner's high um, uh, neurotransmitters, which just, they sort of, you know, they just elevate your mood. And so, and they also will elevate your pain tolerance. Now, <clears throat> perception of effort is a different perception than pain but they're pretty much parallel. So anything that's likely to increase your pain tolerance is also likely to increase your tolerance for perceived effort. So this phenomenon is referred to as behavioral synchrony. So, you know, if you're chopping wood, you can chop more wood if there are, you know, eight guys around you doing the same thing. If you're, you know, running a marathon or, you know, more importantly, if you're training day in and day out with a group of, of athletes, you're more likely to just be able to push harder, dig deeper, and make more progress than if you're always out there alone. Right. So, I mean, that's kind of, maybe that's one of the uh, geniuses of CrossFit, right? Where it's very social. You have a box, you have these people there that are pushing you, or you're maybe competing against them uh, in a positive way to push yourself beyond what you thought you're capable of. Yeah. So, um, you know, just to, to add on to that, so th there are actually two things going on there. So there's behavioral synchrony, and there's competition. And so you can benefit from both. And sometimes it can be hard to, <clears throat> to separate them, but, but you, you actually can do that. So you can benefit in both ways. So part of it is competitive, but part of it is also cooperative. Um, so yeah, you know, it's just, you know, we're, and, and that's why, that's one of the reasons that um, you, um, not, not just exercising with other people is performance enhancing, but simply being observed by other people while you're exercising uh, is performance enhancing. So if you just, if you know, people are watching and seeing how well you're doing, you will also be able to p perform better, even though you're not in competition with the people who are simply observing you. Interesting. Um, I'm curious, uh, Matt, that, you know, th your book is focused on endurance athletes, but can some of these coping skills work with strength athletes, whether they're weightlifters or shot putters or, you know, that sort of athlete? Uh, yeah, I would say that, um, you know, the, the coping skills, uh, the framework that I describe in the book is relevant to any athlete or exerciser who experiences fatigue. Uh, and I think that's everyone, you know, even if you do, you know, a set of, uh, you know, barbell squats, uh, there's a reason the 10th one is harder than the first, <laughs> um, you know, you know, so you're dealing with fatigue, even though it's at, it's a very high intensity and, and short duration activity. Um, if you if you are sort of pushing up against uh, fatigue and, and its effects on your perception of effort, then these coping skills can help you uh, perform better. What, one specific one, just to give you you know a, a very concrete example, is and one we haven't really discussed yet is this this idea of in, internal versus external attentional focus. So you know there are basically two directions you can focus your attention uh, during exercise. You can focus it focus it inward. Like, you know, thinking about how your body is moving or thinking about uh, how hard you're working, or you can focus it externally on sort of on the task at hand. You know, it's like, you know, where is my competition or, you know, am I maintaining my pace? And there's research showing that an external focus of attention, uh, just sort of, you know, keeping your, keeping your attention on the task versus uh, sort of hyper-focused internally is performance enhancing in everything from weightlifting to skill sports, to endurance sports. So it's exactly the same skill, 
uh, but it's beneficial and, and you name it, a- any sport, any type of exercise you can name, it's beneficial. Yeah. The whole external internal, uh, focus. I use that, uh, now that you mentioned it in like high school football, when we did, you know, gassers and wind sprints, I remember there was a time where I was just like, I can't do this. And I would just pretend like I wasn't inside my body. Uh-huh. Like it was weird, but it worked. I was yeah. able to push myself. I just didn't, I didn't, I just, I don't know. I kind of like looked at myself from the outside and that for some reason worked for me. Yeah, that's uh, that's called dissociation. And, okay, uh, dissociated, not knowing that yeah. I dissociated. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, that that's that's another one. Yeah, yeah, and just you know, from a strength perspective, you know, I was you were talking earlier before we started the interview. You know, when I, while I was reading this book, I started using some of the coping skills with my own uh, strength training, um, and it helped out a lot. And the ones that worked for me were bracing, just accepting that this is going to suck. It's going to, it's going to hurt. Yep. <laughs> um, and then the other thing that just helped me is just, it's reminding myself that, um, my body is capable of pushing this weight up, even though I might not think it is like, there's enough in me physiologically that I can do it. And for some reason that helped as well. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not surprised to hear that. And it's really a lot of fun. You know, you're just sort of, um, you know, you, you know, obviously, you know, lifting weights is, is very physical, but, it can also be, you know, intellectually stimulating as well. So if you start to, uh, you know, just actively pursue the development of your mental fitness, you know, whether it's as an endurance athlete or a weightlifter or whatever, um, it just it just adds another layer to the experience. Um, and you know, for for me, you know, I'm I've been a, a runner my whole life and a triathlete, and but you know, I'm I'm in my mid 40s now, so I'm not getting faster, but I'm still like just super engaged in, you know, continuing as an athlete because the journey never ends. You can, you can still get better and better and better at the psychological side, even, you know, as your body gets older. So, I mean, what do you do? So we've talked about these different coping skills and it, it seems like there's some of it, it, you have to, you do it as you, you're going, going along in your training and you develop these coping skills. But is there, I mean, is there one coping skill that a lot of athletes just turn to when they're in that meet moment, the heat of the moment in the race and their body just, their, their body says to them or it thinks it's saying to them, like, you can't go any further, ease up. Um, you'll get it next time. I mean, how do you dig deep in that moment when you hit the wall? I mean, do you just yeah. have to ask yourself that question? That, that's the title of your book. How bad do you want it? Yeah. Great question. And, and it's interesting, you know, one of you know, my, my book has been very well received. Uh, but one of the criticisms I've gotten from some people is that uh, there are some readers who wanted more hand holding. Right. Uh, you know, they wanted like, you know, just do these five things. Yeah, everyone wants that, right? Yeah, you'll be a mental giant. And, you know, I understand that. But actually, part of what I love about, uh, you know, the sports I do is that that's impossible. That, um, you know, what I can provide is just a different way to approach the sport, a different way to understand what you're doing, which I think is actually extremely helpful. Uh, but what, what I can't do is say, you know, just do this. And, and I like that. I like that after a certain point, you're on your own. <laughs> and you just are. And, 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 and especially, you know, when you get to that crisis moment, um, in, you know, in, in a race or whatever, where, uh, you know, you, you want to pack it in, uh, you're suffering a lot. There's just no telling what is going to, to allow you to, to, to keep going. Um, you know, it's not as if, you know, for, it's not as if it's completely different for every athlete. Obviously there are, there are sort of patterns. Uh, but just to, to give the example of, of that 50 mile ultra marathon I, I did, um, uh, last weekend, you know, I, I, I certainly, you know, I suffered mightily. Um, and I remember getting to one point in the race where, I remembered uh, what what a friend had said before the race. Uh, I actually had an injury going into the race. I wasn't sure I would even be able to to do it. Um, And and his advice was be grateful, Um, you know, just for, you know, for just being able to at least start and try. And I just remembered that. It just came to me. It's not as if I had a plan. It's like, oh, yeah, when I get to 37 miles, I'm going to remind myself to be grateful. It's just my, you know, know, most of our, most of our mind is, is, you know, underwater it's the part of the iceberg that's below the surface and just and and that's where you know creativity comes from it's where where so many of the answers come from but it's like stuff is being handed to you from behind a curtain you can't control that but you can you can trust it you know and when you get to one of those moments and it just comes to you it's right you know you just you you can't you can't sort of set it up 
ahead of time, like, oh, I'm going to script out my entire 50 miles. It's like, no, <laughs> you have to be reactive just as you do like in a, in a basketball game. Uh, but it really helped me to just remind myself, you know what? I'm really suffering here, but I am, you know, I am going to finish this thing. And I am super grateful just to, you know, to have this opportunity to be able to do this. And it made a difference. Um, but you know, I'm sure for the other 700 athletes out there racing with me, uh, it wasn't necessarily that, that that allowed them to to get over the hump, as it were. Right. So you're on your own. You got to figure it out yourself. What works for you? Yeah. And just to, you know, to add one other thing, um, to get back to your original question, the "how bad do you want it?" question. Um, th- you know, that's the motivation piece, um, and, and and that is very helpful as well when you when you you know start to struggle. Um, to reconnect with why this is important to you can be extremely helpful. Again, it's going to be important to different people for different reasons. So there, there's no one size fits all there either. Um, but, but on a general level, it's the same for everyone. The, the, the more you're able to sort of just, you know, reconnect and remind yourself, you know, why you want it badly, you know, uh, why you want to achieve your goal or make it to the finish line, uh, whether it's, you know, to set example for your children, or if it's, you know, sort of just, um, you know, uh, maybe you were a, a child who was completely unathletic and, you know, this is sort of like a, a second chance for you to, to just, you know, connect with your physical side, whatever it is, um, that those things, those are powerful motivators because you, it's, it takes a lot of hard work to do the training to, to get to these events. So obviously there's something driving you and to not lose, uh, that in, you know, in, in the heat of the moment, uh, can be one, another one of those uh, factors that, that helps you survive. Well, Matt, this has been a, a fascinating conversation and we've, we just skimmed over a lot of what's in the book. There's a lot more that our readers can dig into, but uh, where can people learn more about your book? Uh, yeah. So the best place to start would be my website probably, which is uh, mattfitzgerald.org. Okay. Well, Matt Fitzgerald, thank you so much for your time. It's been a pleasure. You bet. I really enjoyed it. My guest today was Matt Fitzgerald. He's the author of the book, How Bad Do You Want It? It's available on amazon.com and bookstores everywhere. You can also find out more information about Matt's work at mattfitzgerald.org. And be sure to check out the show notes for this podcast at aom.is slash Fitzgerald, where you'll find links to resources we mentioned in the podcast where you can explore this topic uh, in more detail.